Uh, my name is Earl W. Stafford. Well, what I'm currently doing is trying to learn how to retire, and I'm failing that course. But um, uh, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm involved. I'm, I'm having one of the best periods of my life. I'm involved in several uh, nonprofit efforts, and uh, business-wise, I still run the uh, the Wentworth Group, which is a, a, sm a company that invests in and supports the uh, small business community in the tech sector. And I was, um, I was 20 some years old when I first came to UMass, I was married with a child. Uh, one of the questions asked, where did you live in Southwest Orchid? No, I was um, still in the military. I don't know if you remember the old Westover Air Force Base. Yeah, Westover, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was able to get housing, free housing, uh, <laughs> there on the base and my wife worked there so i really didn't have that on-campus experience there at the university as as most students do but um umass was special for me it it, it was a welcoming environment i want you to remember now that i got there in 70 73 i think it was 73 74 yeah. and that was at the end of the vietnam war era yeah. i was in the military required to wear my uniform um, and I was just as nervous but I will tell you this the campus the people there they were just as welcoming uh, uh, it was really 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 great the academic experience I think I learned a couple things there and that has helped me to um, uh, in my business life after after that it was it was a challenge okay and my wife worked and uh we needed her to work and so she worked on base they did not westover the air force base was closing at the time yeah. so there was no daycare center or anything the daycare centers we found were on campus and the ones that we did find they were an am and a, a pm so we had two different ones and um it was good for my son. It, it was a it was a great, uh, diverse environment for him. But for me, I had to schedule classes around picking him up at eleven thirty, getting him something to eat, changing his clothes, washing him up in the bathroom at one of the dorms, running over to the other place and having him there. And uh, my classes aligned so that at four o'clock or so, I had to run and pick him up and 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 get him home. If I had an evening class, I'd drive back to Chicopee Falls, come back again, take the class, and then on weekends come up. So um, it was a challenge, but all of us have challenges in life that we, uh, that we deal with. But it was an experience, and I was impressed with how welcoming and how accommodating the university was and helping me deal with that situation. I, I was, uh, uh, it was a good experience that we look back on. When I was young uh, in the small town in New Jersey I was raised at, um, uh, it was an old school town. When an adult told you to do something, there was, it wasn't a question, you know, and you know, it's not like today, but Miss Ada Mason, who was a uh, usher down at my church, Miss Ada Mason did not play. She was probably five feet tall in high heels, but she's one of the toughest ladies I've ever met in my life. A uh, long story, one morning when I was, uh, Saturday morning, I was going to get ready to go out and play baseball at the factory with the guys out in the field. She came by and told my mother, Miss Mabel, I'm going to take your boy with me and we're going to go down and sell hot dogs and sodas on the corner. And she said, all right, Miss Mabel. And that's all they did back in those days. And she never asked me, Earl, would you like to go? Or Earl, would you? She just said, get in the car. So I got in the car with her. And that's what we did every Saturday morning that summer. But out of that experience, and I was, I was begrudged, but out of that experience, I learned something about, oh, you can buy it for this price and sell it for that price. And oh, you put a sign up on the telephone pole, and that's what they did back then. You put signs up, you know, hot dogs on the corner and things like that. Taught me how to count money, how to reinvest it. I didn't know it at that time, but she was giving me an introduction to business. And uh, that and a couple of the experiences gave me that entrepreneurial bug so that when I finished my career after 20 years in the Air Force, armed with an MBA, I knew I wanted to go into business for myself. Mm -hmm. The Air Force was good to me, offered me educational opportunities and training. I was trained as an air traffic controller. 
okay? And it was a pretty rigorous process. And um, so I did that. They offered me a scholarship to some universities and I chose the University of Massachusetts and became an officer and became an air traffic control officer. I will tell you a quick story. Um, at that time, I got assigned to, during the war, got assigned over Southeast Asia. And um, I, I went over, but I always, I was reading Solo Nights. I was reading a black, uh, 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 Panther newspaper, the news. Oh, I just wanted to sink it all in. And I had this book on how to teach yourself Swahili. And, and I was one of the, at one time, the only black air traffic controller in the whole country. And I certainly was the only black controller there at the base I was in at Talk Lee. And uh, so we, you know, we, we, we engaged, but afterwards when you went downtown or whatever, the blacks went one way and the whites went the other way and that's what happened. But I was reading these books and just learning. I wanted the history book, um, Lerone Bennett, what's his books? Um, Before the Mayflower. Before the Mayflower, oh, oh my God, I still, I gave that to all my children, mandatory reading. And, and I just wanted to learn more. And the white sergeant came in and he saw me reading that and thought it was propaganda. I got letters of reprimand. I had to go and see the commander and, and all my records, I have letter and one letter of counseling, which is harsher than letter of reprimand for, for, uh, 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 for actions unbecoming, behavior unbecoming. And I couldn't understand, I wasn't doing anything. I'm learning a language, I'm reading my history. But that was a threat to them at the time. One day I was uh, down in the homestead and I'm controlling traffic. I'm busier than one. I'm, I'm busy. And I cleared this up for the land and I'm, I'm looking around. And this white sergeant, Sergeant Rourke, he says, Stafford, do you know who that is? You just cleared the land? And I'm busy. I couldn't. Talk. I said, no, sir, I, I don't. He said, take your glasses and look down. I said, Sarge, I'm too busy. He said, look down there. And I got my glasses and I looked down and I saw this black colonel, which you didn't see in the 60s a lot, mm -hmm. this black colonel getting out of this F4, mm -hmm. this fighter. And I said, well, uh, Sarge, and I started working. I said, who is that? He said, that's uh, Chappie James. Yeah. Yeah. I said, who's the Chappie James? <laughs> and he says, I'm going to talk to you later. Now, this Sergeant August T. Rourke, I won't forget him. He was a, I don't want to say redneck, but anyhow, he was from Georgia. He, he was no friend to the black man. <laughs> that man sat down there when things slowed down, and he told me about the Tuskegee Airmen experience. And I'm embarrassed that he had to tell me about my history and all the wonderful things that the Tuskegee Airmen had done. But I got a chance to meet Colonel James. He became a four-star general. And, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I'm a member of the East Coast chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen. I, I, I keep a membership there. That yes. story Did you know that Bromley, Bromley was a Tuskegee Airman? No, he wasn't. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. I did not realize that. He never, he never talked about it. I never realized that. He never I, said a word about it. That's a heck of an experience back then. The I found Air his name in a book somewhere and said, Bill, is this you? And he said, yeah. He said, you don't talk about it. Say nothing to talk about. Oh, that, that's, 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 that's the story. Yeah. No, no, too many, I mean, you, you lose too many people. Like, too many, you, you know, he's thinking they, they're losing 50% of a squadron every time they go up. And he said, you don't want to talk, you want to talk about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they never let a bomber get shot down over Germany. Right. No, no, but the, the casualty rate was horrendous. Yeah. You know, it was for everybody, but theirs was about, they were running, I mean, the, the Germans are pretty good at shooting down planes, you know, and so it just wasn't easy work to do at all. Pretty soon the bombers started asking for those guys in the red tails and uh, uh, to escort them into Berlin. Yeah. It's like, well, none of half of them don't come back. They don't know. come back. And, and that's why we need to keep those stories alive. My grandchildren, they're sick and tired of pop up telling them about these stories and those things. But they'll remember and, and, and keep it alive. I. Um, became a part of Monumental Sports, which owns the Capitals and the Wizards and the Mystics and about six teams. And I made an investment. I was uh, able to be a part of that. 
didn't know much about hockey at all because you know we 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 don't do the cold a lot. <laughs> and uh, but I will tell you that it has been an experience for me, and um, I did not realize the history of hockey really emanated from run, uh, uh, underground railroad slaves from South Carolina going up to ca uh, to Canada, <laughs> and uh, so I made an investment. Um, one of the executive producers on a film, a documentary called Willie. Willie O'Ree was the first black player to play in the NHL. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he's, a, he's a great man. But I made a commitment since then. I'm on the board of the African American Museum and there was nothing about his story there. So after a long fight, we were able to get uh, uh, that told. I think our young people, even the adults, we need to know those stories. We need to know that, okay, we've been excluded here and it was uh, 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 the bigotry in hockey here, but we are part of the beginning of ho hockey. Mm -hmm. We helped make it where it is. Yeah. So I'm serving with the NHL now on their diversity effort to, um, uh, uh, to change that environment, that landscape there, that it should be welcoming for everybody. You look at your base in the NHL, this is 90 some percent of your economic base. Most of them are, I don't want to categorize, blue collar, not ethnically uh, sensitive. Many of them are uh, and doing that. How do you change without alienating your base? You see, you depend upon that dollar, but you have a responsibility you, you, you have an obligation to make social change and to stand up and to speak out. And so that's the fence that we're playing. And I have some ideas, I don't know if you know it or not, but you gotta, it's gonna be a phased approach, a multifaceted approach that you have to educate, not only the young players. And I call upon them to build more ice skating rinks. You can't tell me that you can't find black players. Well, we, we, we don't have anywhere to, to learn this sport. And so you don't have to build an arena. You can build ice skating, uh, just like you do basketball courts. You can build outdoor ice skating rinks. Yeah. yeah. You can educate, just like I became educated about how hockey really in the 1890s uh, 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 started up in Canada. We took over the sports. We did the goalie thing. And we were playing up in Canada well before here. When the sport came to America, our race itself says, oh, no, we're not going to let blacks play. Well, we were playing many years before then, yeah. you know? So anyhow, we got to do something. Gary Bettman, the commissioner and several others and owners on promoting social justice, we have a, a responsibility for getting the word out, you see. And unbeknownst to a lot of us, many of the players, um, JT, I forgot his name, he's a hockey player. You might recall back in 2017, down in Florida, um, oh, yeah. he raised his fist up and he's been catching hell ever since. But I sat on the panel with JT, um, he still won't relent. They've treated him around and some, but he's still out there speaking. There are some white uh, 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 players there and an all white, almost all white uh, uh, fan base who are coming out and speaking about social justice. So those things are happening. Somehow we have to bring these voices and get them heard more that we're, 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 doing, we're doing those things. But the sports industry has, the multi-billion dollar industry has a responsibility to, to, to social justice.